All right. You want me to kick us off? Yes, sir. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Huddle Up. This is our episode breaking down the wild card weekend and previewing the divisional round. We are your hosts. I'm Andrew DFS, and this is my longtime buddy, Sirak. New episodes drop every Wednesday and Thursday during the NFL season. Make sure you subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And check out ffmetrics.com for the best stats in the game and to get into the head of the brilliant R.C. Fisher, who will drop handicapping advice, fantasy football advice, whatever you need. Go check it out there. And for even more fantasy football content, check out my YouTube handle at Andrew DFS. Sirak, let the audience know what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about my Green Bay Packers defeating those sorry ass cowgirls. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dallas. I'm sorry, Dallas. You guys disappointed. Jerry Jones is about to bury himself somewhere in, in Texas, but that was an amazing game. I'm just excited to talk about that on today's episode and talk about this upcoming uh, week with the playoffs. It's, it's a fun week. Yeah, and we'll, let, let's start things right there. I mean, that was, I think we can safely say that one was the biggest shock of the weekend. The Cowboys were, I believe the spread was seven and a half point home favorites. Yeah. And we liked the Packers with the points. I don't think either of us were thinking yeah. they're going to win, but we thought it was going to be close. And sure enough, Jordan Love, who's been on a freaking tear, continues his excellent play from late season and just goes crazy on the Cowboys. It was insane to watch that happen. Yeah. And I think Jordan Love only made 16 completions, but it was just such an efficient game. I think there was like six or seven throws that were more than 20 yards uh, in completions. So it was just like a big, like we just dissected their defense, essentially just found the holes. Luke Musgrave was wide open all, all game. It was like he was on his own Island. So it was just like a pure domination from all standpoints. And it was, it's just good to deliver that to Mike McCarthy too, former, oh, former yeah. practice coach. And they were talking about how no play, no coach who won a Super Bowl with a team went back into the playoffs and defeated that team. McCarthy had the opportunity to make history there, but obviously yeah. he was on the wrong side of it there. And it just might cost him his job. Oh yeah, I think I think it will. I don't I don't see Mike McCarthy coming back after this. You can, you can see it on Jerry Jones's face, man. Jerry Jones was just like, "I'm done. I'm firing this guy right now." I, they should have fired him at halftime. I think that's what we said in our in our group chat. But yeah, just doesn't look good. The other guy that's on the hot seat now. I mean, we'll we'll get to this later. I, I guess let's let's talk about the whole like playoffs. But what happened this last week? We saw the Packers defeat the Cowboys. We also saw another really really good uh, competitive game, or not another, but. We actually saw one competitive uh, game was the Rams against Detroit. Stafford going into the uh, Stafford going into Detroit, so it was like this like drama behind it, and it was a really fun game. Although that last play where um, Stafford threw to Puka and mm -hmm. that jersey pull, you saw that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was that was a flag. That was a clear penalty. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that the refs are a little more on the Detroit side. There were a lot of very very ferocious hits not only to Stafford but to Puka that pulled him out of the game for a little to Kyron Williams this Detroit defense was aggressive they were violent and they got the better of the Rams here see doc I think your audio cut out can you hear me now yeah I got you now okay okay we're, yeah. good. we're good I'll cut that out anyways there was that one hit that Stafford <laughs> took uh who was the was it Hutchinson, right? You saw that one. Hutchinson got him, and then somebody else flipped him from the legs. It was just like it was a terrible hit. Well, well, there's one where his like eyes roll back. Do you remember? Yeah, that? yeah, dude, that was That's a concussion. That was scary, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they let him play. I mean, you talk. I mean, obviously, we want to see Stafford play. I don't want to act like I I wasn't hoping that he would come back in the game. But you see something like that, and you're like, isn't this what the independent neurologist is for? The guy was clearly yeah knocked out. He was not there for five seconds, maybe even more. Seriously, I don't know how like that guy should lose his job. Whoever the independent, that was like the total BS of a. That's of, his whole job. That's the point. Yeah. You see something like that, it is a concussion. Like there's no, can't tell me it was anything else. But I mean, yeah. good, good for Goff, man. Like honestly, he went up against a team that basically said you took us to the Super Bowl, but you know what, man, you're not good enough. Stafford, you requested a trade. You got what you wanted. You got your Super Bowl, but you don't get this one. You let the city of Detroit win their first playoff game in over 30 years. 
it's, what what irony to the guy like tried to get them their first one so for so many years. But and the cool thing about Detroit is this is their first playoff win, and they'll have a second chance to win their second playoff win this uh, this year because they'll be going against uh, Tampa Bay, as we all yeah. know now. Tampa Bay defeated the Eagles yesterday, Monday night, and it was a bit of a embarrassing loss for Philadelphia. It seems like the entire team is just now under the under the microscope, the coaching the coaching uh team, and everyone's just looking for someone to blame. It just seems it's kind of sad. Yeah, it the way that. They've fallen, man. They were 10-1 and one at one point yeah. this season. Then they lost six out of their last seven. It's just, it's crazy to see both NFC East teams, Eagles and Cowboys, not only they exit the first round when they're favorites, but they get destroyed. I mean, Tampa Bay won 32-9, and Eagles are really, they weren't in this game. Like, they weren't playing defense. Their offense was out of sync. Like it was, it was a mess. I mean, you can attribute yeah. some of it to AJ Brown not being there, but at what point, like, I like, how far does that excuse take you? You lose thirty-two to nine to Baker Mayfield to a Tampa Bay team that maybe doesn't like is a borderline playoff team. Like they, they only won well, nine games and they play in the NFC South. Think about that yeah. for a second. Yeah, hundred percent. And I saw so many. Uh, there was like a lot of um. Uh, videos out there breaking down the plays. I highly recommend anyone to search for them. But they were just showing how many times the Eagles got blitzed and how there was no adjustments made to any of the blitzing. I don't know if it's Jalen Hurts. I don't know if it's offensive coordinator. What's happening there? But there's like a complete disconnect between what's happening in real time and how the all line is being adjusted, not to mention the rest of their defense. It just, like, there's people calling out for Nick Sirianni's job and, like, I don't understand. Like, the guy just won the Super Bowl two years ago. Give him one more year, right? Like, give him one more year. If this team is a mess, then fire him after that. But we also should we also should give some credit to Tampa Bay too, though. Yeah, he won the NFC Championship, but obviously, I mean, he should have probably won the Super Bowl, right? Like, they were so freaking close. But I agree with you, Tampa Bay. All the credit in the world, Baker Mayfield. Like the fact that you won a playoff game with two different teams that that's a pretty cool accomplishment. Not a lot of people yeah. have done that as of late. I mean, you're in you're in company with like Brady and Manning at that point. It's a pretty yeah. cool accomplishment that he did. Yeah, I'm really happy for Baker, man. He deserves it. Like after all the shit he went through from like from Cleveland and now like winning this game in in, in Tampa Bay. And yeah, you were right. I I, I said that Eagles won uh, two years ago. They made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, they should have won. I mean, if it won. wasn't for that Hurts fumble, if you guys remember that when yeah. Casey took it to the house, that was the difference in the game. That was seven points. Eagles lost by three. I mean, it's just that yeah. randomness. You play that game over 100 times, you play that 100 times, I bet it's 50-50. Casey wins 50 of them. Philly wins 50 of them. That Super Bowl day, Casey won. If you yeah. replay the game again, maybe Philly wins. That's how yeah. close those two teams are. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, that was a that was a um, disappointing end for Philadelphia. And then on the AFC side, we saw another great. I I think like everybody was kind of surprised at how this game ended up being, uh, even though Houston was favored. But yeah, Houston mm-hmm. basically um, just sh- demolished. Uh, Actually, Cleveland. it was it was Cleveland that was favored in this. Cleveland oh, was, was Cle- favored. Yeah, 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 yeah okay, it, that's, it's that's, pretty yeah. crazy that yeah. Houston. But it was a short favorite. It was like a I think one and a half point favorite. So it was close, like. I mean, it it was shocking to see Stroud play so freaking good at home. Like, in his first playoff game, D'Amico Ryan's first game as a coach. Like, you have a rookie yeah. head coach, rookie quarterback, and they balled out, man. They they really – this Cleveland defense, as good as they were, I think they were number one at home. They were dead last on the road, and that's what I missed. I picked Cleveland to win. I wasn't super confident about it. But that stat, they don't travel well, and they need the weather. The defense needs the weather behind them, too, and the crowd. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Tank Dell, did, or I should say Stroud didn't have Tank Dell. I think mm-hmm. he also didn't have – he didn't have Noah Brown either, right? He Noah Brown got injured in the game, so he was out the most game. of it. And now he's on IR, so he's not going to yeah. be playing next week. So, so he's doing all this without, like, limited, limited weapons, so it's really, really impressive. And then I guess um, Flacco kind of regressed to the mean and kind of showed us with the back-to-back pick sixes. That was kind of embarrassing to see. But yeah, How many I times are that... we going to see this, though? Backup comes in, Flacco, right? Kills it three, four weeks. And then 
Yeah. It shows you why he's been out of the league for but four or five game. years. It's one it's, game, though. It, I, but if this was the yeah, most I know. important. It was the most critical game. And I bet you if this season continued on four more games, we were going to see a lot more of this than the 400 four touchdown games that he was having right before this. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. The the co- the team already announced that the, that Deshaun Watson will be the starting quarterback next next year, but the rumors are they're trying to sign Flacco to like a backup position, but Flacco might be getting a lot of other interest. It's possible. Oh, I'm sure if I'm Flacco, I'm holding out for a starting job. You go for all the money you can, man. Like you have some good tape there. I would hold out as much as uh, yeah. he needs to. And it was just crazy to see Deshaun Watson back in Houston. And he was, like, not a part of the storyline yeah. whatsoever. Like, if yeah. you told us that before the season started, like, our jaws would drop. I know. It would have been such a good storyline, too. Such a good storyline. And we'll see how Stroud does next week in, in Baltimore. But, uh, Andrew, tell us your thoughts about the KC-Miami game. Because a lot of people were looking forward to this one, including myself. And it was a big disappointment. Yeah. I mean, I had a feeling that Miami was going to get smoked here. They're going on the road in a really hostile environment. That usually doesn't bode well for them. Add in it the weather and a really good KC defense, and that's the result you're going to get. Miami got one deep touchdown to Tyreek Hill, and it looked like a coverage bust in, honestly, bad weather. Mm -hmm. I don't think that... KC does not give up a lot of points to receivers. Like, that just... That's not their style. I mean, they don't give up a lot of points to anyone. So yeah. it was just surprising to even see that happen. But I wasn't surprised with the result. It would have been cool to see a shootout, but you're not going to get that in KC in January. Maybe in Miami in September, we would have seen a more like action-packed game. But this was a typical KC win at home. Yeah. And what's your thoughts about Miami going forward? Because it seems like this formula is not going to work. Like whatever they have right now is not going to be able to defeat the Chiefs or the Bills, or, you know, these other, like, um, Baltimore, they, they, they're they missing something. So I don't know if it's Mike McDaniel. I I love Mike McDaniel, but I don't know what they have to change to make them, a, like, a championship-caliber team. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And let me tell you why. Because they they really need home field advantage. And it's, it's not just Miami, though. It's dome teams. Dome teams just mm. don't – not – sorry – Teams for, from either domes or good weather places like Florida, they they struggle in these situations because they're not used to the cold, to the pressure, to the icy field. When you get tackled on that icy field, mm-hmm. you're hitting concrete, man. And if you're yeah. not used to that, that this, that's the result you're going to get. So one name to watch out for. I know people aren't talking about this, but the Miami owner is a huge, huge Michigan guy. Okay. There's a Michigan coach on the market right now. I'm not saying it's happening, but just drawing the dots and the way that Miami went down, I wouldn't be shocked if the Miami owner made a call to Harbaugh. Wow. That'd be so surprising just because Mike McDaniel is like touted as one of the geniuses of the NFL. But hey, it, it's an, it, anything can happen, right? You could it's be a of... genius. It doesn't mean you're a CEO. Yeah, yeah. So. People are always constantly... Uh, it's all networking when it comes to some of these coaches and how they're hired. So you no, know, that makes that makes sense to me. And I think what Miami needs to do is focus, or they need to do what Chiefs did just two years ago, which is put their focus and money on the defense because their offense is great and it can be like very powerful. But it can only do so much if their defense um, is constantly giving up touchdowns, like like they did it in the second half of the season. So think that's where they should also put their focus in. There was money. a lot of injuries too on that defense. Yeah, I mean, that's we're right. talking about Jalen Phillips, Bradley yeah. Chubb. They lost um a li- a the a couple of linebackers, Baker and um Andrew Van Ginkle, like just a bunch of players. I mean, you had Bruce Irvin and JPP starting for this team. Like, you know what I mean? Justin Houston, like all these retread defensive players from like five, six years ago, we're playing for the Dolphins. Like I'm, that makes sense. That, that didn't, that's why like, I thought that KC could, I, I'm, I'm surprised that KC was held to five field. Like if the weather was good, KC would have really messed them yeah. up. They got lucky. Yeah. I think I didn't put into consideration those injuries. I didn't even know it was that many injuries. So that makes, that makes sense why they kind of fell apart the second half of the season. So that's why it's hard to blame McDaniel, yeah. but I mean, when you get in situations like this, two playoff like 
the biggest loss for Miami was that game in Buffalo two weeks ago. That's when they really lost the playoffs. Sorry, against Buffalo in Miami. Had they won that game, they would not only have home field advantage in the wild card round, they would have had it in the divisional round against KC, possibly. Yeah. So yeah. that made all the difference in the world. Yeah. And that could have turned the tables against this matchup. It wouldn't be in this terrible weather. And who knows? They could possibly win that game uh going into it. But yeah, our our last game from the from this last week's of playoffs was the Buffalo versus Pittsburgh or Pittsburgh in Buffalo, I should say. And this game was delayed from Sunday to Monday due to weather. The teams couldn't fly in or Buffalo, uh, the Pittsburgh couldn't fly in. The Buffalo was basically uh, just a terrible, terrible um, uh, weather. But game played, it was basically domination by Buffalo, what everybody expected. Now the whole spotlight is on, you know, Pittsburgh and whether Tomlin's going to be leaving. Yeah, that that he was asked the question, I think, in the presser. You have one year left on your contract, and he just immediately like shunned the reporter and walked yeah. out. So it's not a good look for Pittsburgh, man. It's been six straight seasons where they haven't won a playoff game, longest stretch in franchise history. It, it's tough. Tomlin puts together these competitive teams, but he's handicapped by his poor QB play. So it, it's yeah. and they were comp- they were actually more competitive than I thought. I think some of that is Buffalo not knowing how to close out teams but at the end of the day i mean this is a results oriented league it wouldn't shock me if tomlin and the steelers come to mutual um understanding yeah. and he walks I mean, supposedly the they want him back but he's the one that wants to reconsider coming back so we'll see we'll see how that how that ends up but yeah that's pretty much the matchups from this last week going into uh this upcoming week we're going to be seeing KC in Buffalo, uh, Houston in Baltimore, Green Bay in San Francisco, and then uh, Tampa Bay in, uh, at the Lions. But we'll go more in depth into those games later on. Yeah, I mean, it's again, like, I'm just a little like shocked that no NFC East team is in the divisional round. That's wild. Yeah. No one would. Yeah, it's like to me, it's it's because of the Lions, right? Like, it's we never see the Lions in the playoffs and now the Packers. So there's two NFC North teams in the, in the uh, NFC playoffs now, which is interesting. And yeah, I, I didn't expect Tampa Bay to be here either. That, that it's just, one's a big it's surprising crazy one. to just see like Tampa at Detroit, like that matchup. Yeah. Like, it's just like a weird matchup. The rest look okay. Like they've somewhat been here. I think it's Detroit mainly throwing it. I mean, Tampa's yeah. been here too. It's just seeing like, two playoff games in Detroit and I'm pumped up for that city, man. I hope they can pull it off again. Yeah. As a Falcons fan, I want you guys to beat Buccaneers. So uh, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So top headlines. I think we should give a shout out to the rookies in uh last week's games. They all had phenomenal performances, debuts, and some of them even set records. Stroud, CJ Stroud, Houston's rookie quarterback, became the youngest QB to win a playoff game, and he tied the playoff rookie co- uh, record for passing touchdowns. He had three of them in the first half and Dang. didn't have another one in the second half because Joe Flacco basically shot the Browns in the foot. He gave him two free touchdowns. Yeah, so there was really no point for Stroud to even go further, like even break that. He tied the record. He could have broken it too. Yeah. Um, what do you think was more impressive? What Stroud did or what Puka did with the 181 uh, receiving yards? I, I would go with Stroud because with yeah. Puka, it's more a receiver's a dependent position, right? Like oh, that's Straf- true. Stafford was dropping dimes. He did well too. He broke DK Metcalf's rookie record. That used to be 160 yards in the playoff game. And he scored 181. It's very impressive. But for me, just seeing how composed Stroud was and everything's on him. And he just didn't blink twice. He's a unicorn, man. Whatever trends you have about rookie quarterbacks, whatever thing you have about rookie head coaches, Stroud is different. He breaks the rules. He breaks the models. You just, you have to go with your gut with him. And he's just, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm genuinely happy. And I hope, I hope Houston in the off season gives him even more, sets himself even better. Cause that Houston O-line is a little shaky. So I want them to add more pieces there and mm. get a, get another receiver, man, and get a running back in there. Go pay Saquon Barkley. You're not playing Stroud. Go pay T. Higgins. 
add even more, like make this offense elect. You guys have a chance. Don't yeah, be surprised. Three that years. Three, three years before yeah. you pay Stroud, yeah. right? Don't be surprised if these guys are in the AFC championship game or even in the Super Bowl as early as next year. Yeah. And they have so much cap space with all the like they, they don't have any big players. I don't know where they've even spent the majority of their caps. So they probably have a lot of cap space. Like you said, go after all the big guys, get Saquon, whoever is available, just grab them up. Yeah. And I believe they still have a first round pick from Cleveland from the Deshaun yeah. Watson tree. Amazing. Amazing. So they gave up their own first round pick to get Will. So they picked two and three in the draft. They got Stroud and Will Anderson, who's been balling out for them too. Best offensive player, best defensive player. You can argue Jalen Carter with Philly or whatever, but I mean, it's just it's crazy what they're building there, and we'll we'll see how we'll see how they fare against Baltimore. Yeah, they definitely gonna be a very fun team to watch for the coming years. But uh, lastly, um, uh, rookie performing really well was Rasheed Rice dropping 130 yards for for Kansas City. Really good to see him being very much more consistent and his first playoff game just basically racking up more than 100 yards. So congrats to him. But we talked about Flacco basically regressing, throwing those two uh, pick sixes back to back drives. Um, just was a big letdown for Cleveland, but the entire team was essentially a letdown as well. It was um, not a very competitive game. Yeah, what shocked me the most was how the defense didn't show up. I, I didn't think that they would fall flat, but if you yeah. look closer at their home road splits, you could have seen that they had an issue traveling. So that that was a tough one to... to they, they, were, they were really freaking good, man. But if yeah. this game was in Cleveland, it might have ended differently. And again, too, they also had their own injuries with, you know, they lost Nick Chubb. Of course, they, they lost Deshaun Watson, but we don't know how bad Deshaun Watson's injury really was for the team. Amari but, Cooper didn't... Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. But Cooper didn't look right either. Yeah, yeah. Something true. seemed off with him, so. But yeah, I, I talked about earlier on in the episode, Cowboys getting waxed by Green Bay. It was really... like I, I watched the entire game, so obviously, as a Packer fan, like... I watched the entire game. I just saw like the what was happening. One, like Dak and CD got to a really slow start. Two, um, the, the third down, fourth down conversions, it just seemed like non-existent for, for the Cowboys. And then we just basically picked apart their their defense with our with our passing. Like it was nothing fancy. Like we had 20, 30, 40 yard deep passes. So it's just like a complete like crapshoot for for the Cowboys, the their defensive coach, Dan Quinn. I think. Um, he was he was supposed to get a lot of interviews and a lot of head coaching opportunities mm -hmm. this offseason, but with this loss, I don't know if that's going to really happen. How do you explain that to someone yeah. trying to hire you, to Seattle? What went wrong? And it, this isn't the first time this has happened to Dan Quinn. Actually, anytime he goes up against his former offensive assistants, Kyle Shanahan, Mike, McDan Mike McDaniels, Matt LaFleur, these guys were all on Atlanta Super Bowl winning stat, a soup winning, yeah, Super Bowl Um I'm sorry, man. I know Finalist, it whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it still hurts. Belichick, save us, man. Um, right your wrongs. But anytime he goes up against his former offensive guys, he's 0-6 as the Cowboys DC playing those coaches. That's crazy. And you saw receivers running wide open. What does that mean when you just see like Musgrave, no one around him, Dobbs went crazy? It tells me that... Dan Quinn has not adjusted his defense since his days in Atlanta seven, eight years ago. And wow. basically what happened is every defense, no matter what it is, has rules. If you run through the middle of the field, safety drops down, corner does this, whatever. If you know the rules of a defense, these this goes a little more in depth. Richard Sherman talks about this and how Dan Quinn actually did this to them as the Atlanta coach and messed up the Seattle defense. Now they're doing it to his defense. Basically, these rules dictate what a safety needs to do if a receiver goes in the middle. But you can, if you know those rules, you can manipulate it. Yeah. And just draw, you can have coverage, but one coverage bust is an anomaly, right? Like it happened with Tyreek Hill against Kansas City. When you have three, four, five, there's a trend. That means Matt LaFleur knew what was going on. He knew how to poke holes at that defense, and it was be it was beautiful to see it. Wow. So that, that's, that's my theory on yeah, what happened. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good theory. That's a really good theory because, like you said, it doesn't just happen once, twice, or three. Like It happened 
if, if it's happening multiple times and there's like a like there's a system issue, there's something that that other team knows, and you would think Danko would change something after six, seven years of doing the same thing, and other teams like kind of, you know, figuring it out. So that's that's crazy. Yeah, it's just it's wild to me, and the fact that like they were just so open, man. So I mean, the one that sticks out to me is Musk. I have Musgrave. There was like no yeah. one within like. It was 20 nuts, yards. Man. Yeah, no one within 20 yards. Yeah. And it's a tight yeah. end, not even like a fast guy, which is the the funniest part about it. The the thing that caught me off guard here, and I turned on the TV late, so I like turned on right at kickoff. It, automatically, the announcers were talking about how Dak and CD, there was some tension between them. And early on, their chemistry was off. Did you, yeah. was there, did you see anything? Like, did they fight? I didn't see any fight or any arguments, anything like that. It just they were just weren't connecting. It seemed like they were on different pages. I don't know if it was who who was the center of like the problem, CD or Dak. But I didn't see any like issues that made me think that they're not doing well. I even saw I even saw Dak going up to CD at, after one of the drives and being like, "We got this," being positive. So I don't know. Did yeah, you, yeah. I don't very, know where very that strange. I don't know where it came from, but the yeah. broadcasters spoke about it. So I'm like, oh, maybe I missed something pregame. Were they stretching and? Yeah. I don't know if they get mad at each other, but it was weird. Yeah, very, very weird, weird outcome. But yeah, I think uh, going into next week, it's gonna be really fun going going into uh, San Francisco. I don't expect us to win. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that game. We'll get to that game. I don't want to talk, talk talk ahead. But uh, Detroit versus Rams, we talked about it. Live up to expectations all around. The Rams offense uh, played really good, and was at the end, of course, um, Detroit uh, squeezed out. Now. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Bills game and the uh, Pittsburgh game, but is there anything else we want to to cover, uh, Andrew? Before we get to the studs and duds. Um, before we get to studs and duds, the last thing I'll say is that that Stafford versus Goff thing. I think the football gods, right, let Goff have this one. You know, Stafford yeah. was the one who requested the trade. He was the one that. You know, won the Super Bowl. It was kind of cool to see Goff, who who's pretty much on the he he was the butt of uh, like on he was on the yeah. bad side of this, right? Like, yeah, he was blamed. You needed like, oh, Rams made a mistake by paying Goff. Like here, Detroit, here's Goff and a bunch of first round picks, which yeah. they used wisely. They built a team around Goff, and now look at them; they're one win away from the NFC Championship game. Yeah. Very big, like everything just, it was like a Uno, a Uno card, everything reversed because like you said, it was like as if golf was on the bad side. He was the reason that the Rams failed, et cetera, et cetera. It got traded. I thought it was his career would have been done in like five years, but no, I'm really happy for the guy. He deserves it. And yeah, man, just one uh, more thing. Dan Campbell at the end, his post-game speech. I don't know if you caught this, but no, he, he gave the game ball to golf and he's like, Jared, you're good enough for Detroit. And like, I just got so much goosebumps. I'm like, dude, like, I wish you guys were good enough to beat San Francisco, but you're, you're not like, hey, you're and not that they're playing next week, but eventually when they do meet, like they, they, they can't, they just, they're not there yet, but like, yeah. it, it, they're just so easy to root for. Yeah. They'll definitely be there, man. I think give them another year, two years, build that team. They got to keep, keep making it. the right decision. I mean, I gave him a lot of crap for drafting Laporta, for drafting Gibbs. They're making me swallow my yeah. words. But they have a problem in the secondary, and it's very obvious. Their run defense is A+. Plus. They Kyron Williams, that guy was on a freaking bender, man, and he could not be stopped. Yeah. Detroit was able to quiet. When they travel... They're also not a great like road team. So that's why like them going into San Fran, I know we're really looking ahead now, is like concerns me, but they really like need to use their cap space wisely and buy some corners. Like you you let Darius Slay go a couple years ago. That was a perfect corner for you on the market. Jamel mm -hmm. Dean. Jamel Dean, Tampa's corner is one of the best in the league. They could have pursued him. They traded Jeff Okuda to the Falcons. Like they're they let go of a lot of corners yeah. you know and they yeah did, they didn't backfill them so hopefully yeah. they try to do that this offseason yeah very true hope maybe they can draft one or like you said find find a uh, coveted free agent and get him on the team yep you're not paying golf 50 million a year so 
Yeah, but they might, they're gonna have to pay him up whenever his contract comes comes to renew. Yeah, or he's not, not that a fifty much. mil. Yeah, well, yeah. here's the here's the deal with that. He there's a reason why Tampa Bay is good too. They're only paying Baker four million a year. Mm. So with QBs, look, look, I'm very happy with Go- with what Goff did. I'm proud. I'm like honestly like suit like just for him like it, it's crazy to see. But you can't pay him fifty million a year. It'll yeah. tank the team. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes sense. So, okay, let's dive into the studs and duds of the weekend. This list is going to be a lot shorter than other weeks, just given that there were only six games. But there were quite a few QBs. Five QBs made it to our studs list. First one, yeah. Dak Prescott, even though Cowboys lost, they were on the field quite a bit, and he racked up some garbage yeah. time points. Which All was- garbage time, yeah. 400 yards, I think, what, four touchdowns. Very li- very good line, but it was all garbage time. Yeah, exactly. You had Josh Allen, four total touchdowns, who had a Peace. really good day against Pittsburgh, yep. including one, like, what, 60-yard rushing touchdown. And then um, Baker Mayfield, Matt Stafford, and Jordan Love round up the stud QBs of the week. Yes, and then running backs, Aaron Jones got three touchdowns this last game. Tony Pollard still had a good game. And we all saw Kareem Hunt playing, uh, playing pretty, pretty good in his loss to, uh, uh Houston. And then yeah, Luka, we, yeah. No, I was just gonna say yeah. Aaron Jones homecoming for him in Dallas, and he always every time he plays the Cowboys, he kills I mean, he, them. he owns the Cowboys. He owns yeah. the Cowboys. Yeah. But uh, Puka, we talked about it. He broke a record, uh, NFL rookie record for a playoff uh, yards uh, for a rookie. Sorry, in a, in a playoff game for a rookie. And then uh, Dubs. I never know how to say his name correctly. Dubs, Dubs. But uh, Dubs had a great game for the Packers. Uh, Rasheed Rice, we talked about it, 130 yards. Devontae Smith played great. And then Michael Gallup uh, was also our last stud for the for the receivers. Yeah, and for the tight ends, we had Jake Ferguson, who's the beneficiary of a lot of Dak's garbage time um, throws. Cade Auten, who out of nowhere just like had a crazy fantasy day. Um Brevin Jordan, who took one Stroud pass for 76 yards and a touchdown. He was a very cheap DFS play, too, if you guys had him in lineups. And Luke Musgrave for the Packers all had yep. really good days. Yep, wide open all day, Musgrave. And uh, defense, uh, we still had some good defenses, even though it was the playoffs. We had Texans and the Packers. And, of course, even the Chiefs had um, – they, they held the uh, Miami Dolphins to just one, one score, so they didn't have a lot of, like – Defensive yeah. scoring, but they were just very dominant. And that's the key with defense is like Texans and Packers, I think both had defensive touchdowns. Yeah. So I mean Texans, I think, had two of them. So yeah, two big yep. sixes. So that that's essentially how you get on the stud list there. But exactly. Duds wise, Jalen Hurts and Tua Oof. just yeah, brutal, brutal crash landing for both of them. Yeah. Hurts just I think Hurts like Hurts obviously was surrounded by a team that wasn't complete and coaching staff, but he also played bad too. So it's just it's all around um the everyone is to blame. And Tua just of course too the team didn't show up. So just a I mean this is gonna get you on a tangent, but which year was the anomaly? Was it this year or last year with Hertz? What are we gonna get next year? Huh. And it, it's think it's about this question. too when they remove the touch push. Yeah, you know? I mean, for fantasy wise, that that's gonna be yeah huge, right? Like just from a like he would he would get like what like ten touchdowns at least from that yeah. play, but I mean, do you think all that wear that tush push is a wear and tear type of play? Like yeah. the offensive line aged hurts like clearly yeah. wasn't right. Like, I mean, if I had to answer that right now, I would say that this year was a was was an anomaly and only because like I've seen hurts consistently play well. And even this year, like he had times where he played really good. So yeah, I think this year was more of an anomaly for the entire Eagles, even. Like I, I really I feel really strongly that the Eagles they just go back home, maybe change Matt Patricia out, put in a couple maybe put in a new defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, but keep Sirianni there and just retry the same thing again, you know? Like I think they they'll they'll be a good team. They just need a new coaching uh, staff, besides the obviously the head coach. In normal years, I'd agree with you. I would think it's very premature to fire um, Sirianni. And it's it's up the GMs out. He's he's kind of ir- like, he'll make decisions quickly. So this year, though, 
there are just too many good head coaches on the market between Bill Belichick, Mike Vrabel, Pete Carroll, Jim Harbaugh, possibly even Tomlin, where I could see Sirianni and even McCarthy getting let go, even though their team, like, you know, McCarthy won the division. The Eagles had 11 wins and they were looking really good. They were 10 and one at one point. So it, it's going to be tough, man. Like if you have a coach like that, like Jim Harbaugh, how do you say no to him? Yeah, that's true. I guess it's just, you know, which uh, it's tough because Nick Sirianni too, he like, he's only the coach for what, three years or something. So even mm-hmm. him, like, you don't know what, if, if he is like a great coach or not, it could just be got lucky that one year. So, uh yeah i had tough. i had issues with him his first year he looked really weak to be honest with you his offensive schemes like i don't know just didn't look right and they weren't really that efficient but then they got aj brown last year mm-hmm. and they blew up shane steichen and jonathan Ga- gannon get interviews and leave and they're coaching elsewhere now and now like it's like okay you took away two very talented coordinators and like what do you do like, yeah, he's so that's why it's true. Tough. That's a good point. That's a really good point. They did lose everybody in the offseason, and now it's himself, and he doesn't have the wherewithal to do it, do it by himself. So, yeah, yeah. Well, let's continue. On the yeah, Go running back side James Cook, DeAndre Swift, my boy Rashad White, ah. Kyron Williams, Jalen Warren, Najee Harris, James Ford, Devon A. Chain, Raheem Moster. A lot of lot of uh, running backs this last week. See, seeing both the Miami Dolphins there, um, and yeah, just overall, uh, I think because of the, I guess the way the way the games played out, I would say like some of these games had bad weather, so you would have expected the running backs to play a little bit more. But overall, just uh, not good for the running backs. Receivers though, Tyreek uh, was a dud. Mike Evans, Diggs, Cup, um, and Waddle, and and yeah. and uh, Amari Mar- Cooper. You, you, and- on the dock, you put Cup Cooper, so it just confused me. I thought you meant to put Cooper Cup. If I wrote Cooper Cup, I think you would have thought it was one yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. That's why I went that way. Or I could have just separated it out you more. You separated them. <laughs> but Tyreek Hill, I mean, even though he had that one deep shot for his salary on DraftKings, it's just like you you need more than just that deep. I think it, it only like he only had like 14, 15 points if you're paying like nine grand for him. Yeah. You're gonna need over 30 minimum. So yeah, for sure. And and then tight end wise, the only real dud, like the expensive player that just didn't hit Sam Laporta, who had kind of like Tyreek one touchdown, and it's pretty much it. Yep. And then we have the Cowboys, of course, were huge duds, and the Browns as well. They got scored on, I think it was 45 points or so. So yeah, both those defenses were not were very disappointing based on their cost. And with that, let's head into very exciting divisional preview of uh this week's matchups. Yeah, and we all we like to start this segment off with giving a stat and it's actually very similar to the one that we gave last week and it's going to come in handy and that's double digit favorites in the playoffs cover at a higher clip than the regular season and it hits at over 60% and there's two matchups that might fall into that category. First one is Houston at Baltimore. Right now, Baltimore is a nine and a half point home favorite and could easily get up to 10. And the over under here is 44 and a half. So week one, Stroud traveled to Baltimore and pretty much like he didn't embarrass himself, but they did actually not do that great either. Baltimore Mm -hmm. had their way with them. But Lamar Jackson in the playoffs doesn't do all that great. This is what he's kind of, he kind of like has the DAC problem where he folds in the playoffs. Sidok, what do you think? Do you think Lamar gets this done? Or do you think Stroud continues shocking the world? Yeah, I think I actually think that I agree with you. That, and I don't think Lamar has to do much to get the Baltimore to win this game. I think Baltimore can just dominate on defense, dominate the ground game with Gus Edwards and just kind of have one of those Baltimore games where Lamar doesn't have to have that much of an input. He still has a good game, but obviously not like four touchdowns or something like that. So, yeah, I think Baltimore comes out in this one. Maybe I could see them winning by two touchdowns um, by the end of the game. 
Uh, maybe keeping, maybe Houston keeps it a little bit close, a little competitive. Like, oh, if they have a chance to maybe like get a touchdown or two and then make it tie game. But yeah, I think Baltimore comes out and I can see Stroud kind of disappointing in this one. You know, I feel like he's on cloud nine. We saw him last week do amazing. He could come in this game. Baltimore is not a normal defense, right? This they're not. I mean, Browns are good, but Baltimore is different. We're talking about from like. A plus to like a B plus or A minus def- defense. So Baltimore is gonna really get get at Stroud in this one. So here here's the thing that we missed last week. Cleveland defense on the road, not as great. Here's one that we're not gonna miss this week. Stroud at home, amazing. Stroud yeah. on the road, well, not so amazing. He like lost average. to the Panthers. Yeah. Think about that. He lost to the Panthers on the road. So he also beat Cincy on the road too. So let's not forget that. He has that under his belt too. And that's a Joe Burrow Cincy, not Jake Browning Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah. And he is, it's a wild card too because he's a rookie, you know. When you don't have enough data on a person, it sometimes becomes a little bit unpredictable how they're going to act when they're coming to like a playoff game. So it's definitely um, – I think it's going to be a fun game. But So you got you got Baltimore? I have Baltimore winning. Yeah, and I'm contemplating too. the nine and a half. I think I'm gonna lay it and take Baltimore here. And I want people to remember what this Houston defense really is. Yes, they had two pick sixes on Flacco in Houston. Got a little shell shock. Going into Baltimore is gonna be a much taller task. And don't forget that this defense on the road gave up 180 yards to Jonathan Taylor. Baltimore not only has a better O-line than Indy, they they have probably the top O-line in the game, but they also have a better just all-around rushing attack. I know Mm -hmm. none of their running backs scale up to uh, Jonathan Taylor fine, but when you add in the threat of Lamar, the threat of Gus, and Justice Hill, that's that's a lot of people to handle. And don't forget, they also have Dalvin Cook too, who could become a factor in this game. Jets released him right before the playoffs started, and he synced up with the Ravens. Don't be surprised if Dalvin Cook has some sort of role here as this power back guy. They love to just spread carries out. So for DFS purposes, I'd be very careful starting Edwards or Hill because it could be Cook that leads that backfield. Wow, you think he can actually lead it with the carries with his first game? Maybe and it's l- the playoffs. let me retract it. That was a little too much. It's not lead, but cut in yeah. to Edwards and Hill, which would make them all have it can de- he can depress their statistics where yeah. Lamar should have a great day here. Isaiah likely Houston has trouble guarding the tight end. As you saw, they couldn't touch Najoku. Likely is really good as well. So I think Baltimore, even though Lamar has had his playoff struggles, this is a layup game. And if he can't get it done here, there is going to be huge, huge question marks with Lamar. I'll tell you that. And huge exclamation marks with Stroud. Yeah. (laughs) Can you imagine? That'd be that'd be freaking sick. No, that was very well, very well broken down on the Baltimore offensive side. It's their their rushing attack. That all makes sense to me. And that's that's also the reason why I just don't think Lamar has to do insane amount of work here. I think he just has to be like the general and just keep no turnovers, you know, no fumbles, no uh no crazy turnovers. Their defense so, is gonna set him up nicely too. Don't forget that yeah. Baltimore D line, which I believe has uh Jadavion Clowney on it now, yeah. who sort of reinvented himself under this uh Baltimore defense. So they're aggressive. They have really good linebackers too between Rokon Smith, Patrick Queen. They just all around this Baltimore D is really, really good. I'd be nervous if I was starting Houston players in fantasy in DFS. This is not a really good spot for them. If I were to go, if I had to pick a couple players that I'd look at. If you believe in Stroud and think he's going to make this a game, you can't ignore Nico Collins. Mm. Devin Singletary can be a good check down guy. And I also like Dalton Schultz too, just because he can be like a safety valve, like quick passes with Robert Woods out. I mean, sorry, with Noah Brown out. I think Schultz can maybe fill in that role, even though he didn't really do that great. Yeah, and we we did see uh, Schultz fill in that role when Brown was out earlier in the year. 
So that's a, that's a really good really good tip right there for Schultz to kind of uh have a, a a bigger game, and yeah, I agree with the. I just, I agree with like being a little bit wary about starting uh Houston Houston players, especially like Devin Singletary for me because of the Baltimore rushing attack. So a uh, defense, I'm sorry. So, yeah. but he could get cat. Like the thing is with Singletary, yeah. like he has a lot of pass catching upside, and if like Baltimore's just pummeling through that Houston O line, like that's the easiest outlet pass to Singletary. You know, just check down like. Don't forget that Singletary is like a guy for Josh Allen that would get like seven, eight catches a game. Houston doesn't really use him that way. But then again, like Houston really hasn't been put in this situation where they're just going to get blitzed and left and right and not blitz, but just a lot of pressure yeah. from that D line. Yeah. And there's a likely chance that they get down big early on and have to come back and throw the ball a lot. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. I guess uh, that's a good breakdown of the Houston at Baltimore game. Let's ho- head to our uh, to my Packers at at San Francisco. Uh, the line is San Francisco is nine and a half point home favorites. The over under is fifty and a half, fifty and a half, so fifty point five, and there might be seventeen miles per hour winds. Jesus. And then the Packers. Um, something we want to really point out actually. This is a really good statistic that Andrew always finds. And he's always right about these whenever it comes to the next week, which is when defenses play a certain amount of snaps, when they play high snaps, the next week, they're at a very big disadvantage. And we always see these teams going to the next week and basically not showing up and almost. Right, right, Andrew? Yeah, that I mean, it happened earlier this season. And the threshold we look at is 90. Usually if it's like in the 80s too it's good but 90 is that cutoff where it's like if your defense played this many snaps they're going to be tired the following week and probably like give up a lot more points than they normally would and last week that's what happened to green bay even though they dominated the game their dak was on the field a whole bunch and they played not 90 snaps but 95 snaps and for yeah. those of you that want some context here that Eagles Buffalo game that went into overtime, I believe was only 91 snaps. This game didn't even go to overtime. So really think about it that in that short amount of time, the Packers D was on the field for 95 snaps. What happened to the Eagles after they played 91 snaps? They went where to they not went, but they played San Francisco the following week and got That's crushed. Destroyed. Yeah. What's happening here? Packers on the road 95 snaps have to go into san francisco who's like this time they're well rested they weren't even well rested when they played the eagles they were just you know going at them so this this could be nasty yeah i'm very i'm i have to be honest which is i admit that i think this is going to be like a, a blowout and it could, it could start a little bit competitive in the beginning but yeah i think this could be uh, a very embarrassing blowout for my packers but I, um Fantasy wise, I think it's gonna be still a very fun game in terms of like getting points for your DFS leagues. Yeah. Um. So like I I would start everybody obviously on the San Francisco side. Let's break them down first. So Purdy is a great option if you want to double stack him or 100%. triple stack him with CMC, Ayuk, or Debo. I like Ayuk and CMC. Sorry, uh, I like Ayuk, CMC, Purdy stacks personally. Um. And then, uh, of course, Kittle is a great tight end option. I like Kittle because he's an expensive tight end, and usually people don't want to spend up on tight ends. And Kittle always has the chance to just have a crazy, insane game. So he's always like my go-to guy when there's limited options at tight end on like these uh, smaller slates. Yeah, I mean, it, it's two philosophies in DFS. You either go really high or really low, or maybe you go somewhere in the middle like Isaiah Likely. But I can't agree with you more like, Purdy CMC should be a smash stack. You just got to be a little careful. 17 mile per hour wins are a little high for the passing game. So CMC for sure under these conditions is going to be good. I'd stay away from San Francisco defense here in DFS because mm. they're just going to be expensive. And, you know, Green Bay D is the one that played 95 snaps. So I don't think that the Packers offense is just going to come out and fold here, but they are going up against a really good D if I'm looking on the Packers side of things, 
I might stay away from Aaron Jones just because he was so utilized last week that I think it's going to be more like, okay, who didn't pop last week? It was more the passing attack. I know Dobbs went crazy, but everybody else was sort of silent. And the one guy I'm staring at is Jaden Reed. He was mm. a freaking machine as the season ended. Yeah. And then yeah, zero. goose egg. Yeah. Goose egg in the playoffs out of nowhere. Dobbs was the beneficiary of last week's matchup. Yeah. Uh, that's you're right. The Packers offense should not be tired coming into this, so they can still have a really strong game. Aaron Jones will probably be really chalky too with that last week's performance. So yeah, I think Reed will be a really good uh sneaky sneaky play. That's with that goose egg. People are going to be chase off of the him. goose eggs. People yeah. like those players that typically. I mean, he ended the season with ten touchdowns. Think about that. Jaden Reed had ten freaking touchdowns, and he goose egged. So. They're gonna they need him to get involved. I think that like against Dallas, it was just so much like ball control, like hey, let's not like maybe Reed was dealing with something, like let's not push him out here. We got the like like Packers had control of that game from start to finish. Like they didn't, yeah, they were never stressed at any point in the game. So before we before we end the end this game, like recap, I wanna I wanna know what could the Packers do? Let's say the Packers win this game. What did they do to win this game? It's more what the 49ers didn't do than what you guys did, to be honest with you. And I'm not, yeah. and maybe that that's a result of a really good game plan against them. But it it's love taking a Mahomes like step. If love pulls this out, if he wins this game, everyone's gonna view him like he's getting, he's starting to like knock on the door into that class of QBs that are highly regarded. He wins that game. He's he has a seat at the table in my opinion. I yeah. just I don't think that the defense is going to set him up well enough for that to happen. Whether that be like field position, other situations, your defense is just not going to be able to hold back this 49ers offense which traditionally like first game of the playoffs, they come out swinging. So I but the the way that you guys win, Brock Purdy gets injured, and mm. you guys have a shot. But don't, barring don't, don't. anything crazy, that that's how I see it. All right, we're gonna we're gonna Tanya Harding, Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy. Yeah, you know Tanya Harding. What that is? Yeah. The, the who, ice skater that? who got her leg broken. Oh no, I don't. <laughs> Damn. It's like yeah, it was like like I'm just gonna, okay. I have to explain this because or else there's no context. But 30 years ago, there was like this ice skating. Uh, uh, rivalry and one of the girls got her ex-boyfriend to basically break the other girl's leg with a bat it was like a full like very famous thing tanya harding oh my up. god dude that's what you guys need to do to purdy that's the only i mean <laughs> look man there's always there these are and these aren't college teams at the end of the day this isn't fsu playing michigan where they literally have no chance you have a chance yeah i'm just telling you we play this game a hundred times, right? SF probably takes 80 of them. You guys yeah. win 20 of them. So what version is going to show up on Sunday? Meanwhile, if it was FSU Michigan, that's closer to like 98 to two. So that yeah. that's the, the, in college football, the margins are much wider where it's just like, there's talent gaps. Like Packers are a talented team. They have a talented defense they have playmaker like that Ballantyne kid i keep raving over i love that guy like you have young playmakers on the receiving side corners but it's a question like are you guys so young that the 95 snaps don't affect you guys i don't know i yeah. we have to see it and that's why we play the game like no you can't be a hundred percent right you can have the right read and just get screwed by the refs by certain situations you can be put, you can have a unicorn. Maybe Love is a unicorn player and he's blossoming right before our eyes and he's about to be regarded as Mahomes. You yeah. just don't know. Yeah, that's true. And I think it's just, it's just one of those things where you, you, it, it has to be like uh, San Francisco comes and they completely drop the ship. Like they completely drop it all and they fully forget how the whole like, um, their scheme works. But what I did like from the Packers side was like the whole team and how, how much of a camaraderie and like the chemistry that they have. I don't know if you saw the post game video of their, of them in the locker room, but the whole team just looked really happy. And like, they're just there for each other. Like, it's really good to see that. So 
even going to next year, I have high expectations now. And I'm I'm starting to believe in Jordan Love, man. I'm starting to believe in it. I I, I keep saying I'm not 100 percent in for I don't know why. I need to just trust this guy. I, I was mean, the same. If I was you, you moved from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers, and now you're telling me you hit three QBs in a row. Like it's it's unbelievable. It's I like hard, it, it is hard to believe. Like I would be skeptical Crazy. too. Yeah, I was skeptical about Rodgers for at least two or three years, but that was just because of Brett Favre. Like I love Brett Favre, and because Rodgers replaced him, I just didn't like it. So that was I had like personal thing for that. So with love, I just yeah, I need to. I guess if I see one more year of consistency, I'll I'll, I'll believe it hundred percent. I mean the the even if they go down the way I think they are, where they're gonna just get blown out of the water. Love throws two picks, just regresses back to his mean. This was a very successful yeah. season for the Packers, for sure, for sure. So all right, well that covers the Saturday games. Let's hop into Sunday. The morning game is going to be Tampa Bay at Detroit. Detroit is six and a half point home favorites. The over under is 48.5. So Detroit's going for their second playoff uh, home win um, this year. And two quarterbacks who are cast off by the teams they were drafted by now face off again, right? Um, for, for golf at least. But now Tampa Bay um, for Baker does the same. Yeah, it's just crazy how Cleveland said, yeah, we don't want you, Baker. And they're dealing with the – they gave up all that draft capital for Watson. Where, where did that really get them? Like, how how much better off would they have been if they just kept Mayfield and yeah. built around him? And then on the flip side, Jared Goff leaving the Rams. Obviously, Rams got a Super Bowl out of having Stafford there. I don't think they would have won with Goff that year, but you never know. So yeah. both QVs were told they're not good enough, and one of them is going to have the opportunity to – uh play in the NFC championship game. So really cool. Like these are underdog type of stories for me. I just view this Tampa team as a lit. I think this Detroit lines too, too low, low in mm -hmm. the sense that they should be closer to like a nine and a half, nine and a half home favorite or something. I think six and a half is too light because that Tampa team that played Eagle, I think a lot of betters and Vegas is reading too much into what Tampa did to Philly. Mm. New York beat Philly. Arizona beat Philly. Them beating Philly 32-9 to without A.J. Brown and the team in shambles, it doesn't really win points in my book where it popped, like it like raises them in my power ratings. But Detroit beating Stafford, right? Like the QB yeah. that you chose coming into your house and you know that he doesn't want to let Goff win, and Goff not blinking twice, getting his revenge on the team like that. That really like stuck with me, and I was I'm happy to see it. I hope this isn't an emotional play, but I think Detroit's winning this one by ten. Okay, now, I can see that because, like you said, Tampa Bay wasn't like a dominating force against Philadelphia. It felt more like Philadelphia just didn't show up, and they just had the entire team, uh, fully unconnected with with each other. So I agree with you there. My only thing is Tampa Bay, just with the way Baker has been playing, um, and uh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, they're wide receivers. Like we talked about earlier, how Detroit doesn't have that secondary. My only worry is like, can can Baker kind of go back and forth with Jared Goff and have like kind of like this, you know, high scoring game that ends up being just one of those like, um, what is it called? Uh, shootouts. Shootouts, exactly. I I can see a shootout happen between Baker and Goff in this game. Here's why I don't think it's going to happen. And it has to do with the Tampa O-line, which is horrendous and can't block for Rashad White if their life depended on it. They, I think that Detroit front is going to give them serious issues. The way that they messed up Stafford, Tampa Bay's line is worse than Rams mm -hmm. or at least equal to it. So you have one side where you have the home crowd and a very feisty, aggressive defense. They can be beat deep. Evans could get a shot. Godwin could have a shot. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, if you, like, Baker's kind of injured. If you get a nice, clean hit on his ribs or ankle, like, they, he yeah. might not finish that game. There's a good chance Baker doesn't finish that game in my eyes. And that that's why that risk is what I'm, like, kind of baking in to say, okay, six and a half plus three and a half, because I really think that 
that injury is more likely than not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we said the same thing last week too about Baker, but you know, it, it can it can happen any the week. The Eagles D just didn't come through with that, yeah. you know? Like they were not playing like they weren't set up right and they weren't really like motivated to be honest with you. It seemed like the team quit on Sirianni. I hate to use like such a headline like sort of thing like mainstream narrative there, but like it's true like they just look deflated and this Detroit team is anything but. They are going to be so freaking aggressive and it's scary to just think about Baker back there with Aiden Hutchison chasing him. Oh like, yeah, that's true. I don't, I don't like where this is going. And meanwhile, like Detroit loves to run the ball. Tampa, they have people on defense now. Like they, they, their defensive stats are really uh, brought down from their injuries in the middle of the season. They're a lot better now. Now that Vita Vea is back there, uh, Devin White. Jamel Dean in the secondary who I love but I just think this Detroit offense is too well balanced Laporta is going to have one more week to get healthy so yeah it's going to be too much for them okay now uh, you convinced me man you've convinced me that this is going to be a blowout or at least going over the over in this case with the six and a half point home favorite on the Detroit side is there any players that you're targeting uh, that you like for DFS I think for me for example Montgomery could be a really good option just because in this game, if it is going to be a high scoring, let's or sorry, high scoring. If it's if it's going to be a blowout, more than likely in my in my head, I'm thinking David Montgomery's going to get a couple of those or not a couple, but like they get a bunch of drives. Where he's just going to be running the, running the ball, running the ball, trying to trying to burn the time. I think that that's a good one. I like David Montgomery, and he's actually cheaper in DraftKings now. He's only sixty one hundred. So yeah. most people, people want really... Gibbs. Yeah, most people want Gibbs, but I think this could be more of a Montgomery day because Detroit's going to want to uh, ground and pound. But two guys I'm really looking at. One, obviously, you can't ignore Amon Ross St. Brown, right? So oh, no. he, he PPR machine, all pro, by the way. He made the all pro team this year. Amazing. But the other guy is our prodigal, I don't know if I said it right, prodigal son, Jamison Williams, someone that we love. We love to watch. Always oh, comes through. He's been playing a lot of the snap counts. He only had two targets last week, but I don't know if it's just me rooting for one of my players, but man, something just tells me that Jamison Williams is going to be a big X factor in this one. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he always has the chance to get you like a huge touchdown or two touchdowns and basically make his what three or 4,000 salary. Uh, a huge advantage. So yeah, for sure. On a Sunday slate like this, you're gonna need a guy who's gonna be very cheap value who can give you that big upside. I think Jameson Williams is one of those one of the best guys to do that on on a Sunday because looking at the rest of the slate, there isn't that many good options for cheap wide receiver plays at that price that can give you that upside. So yeah, I agree with that. Um, anything else you want to discuss with this with this one before we go into the last game? On the Tampa side, obviously, it's hard to ignore oh, yeah. Evans against the Detroit secondary. Hard to ignore Godwin. But one name to keep an eye on, and unfortunately, he's going to be chalky, is Cade Otten. And the reason why I say keep an eye on him is he'll probably be available for that quick outlet pass to, uh, from Br Baker if, there's a, if the line can't hold up. Otten was targeted 11 times last week. Eagles mm. actually have a good front. So they were getting to Baker. It's just that he was releasing the ball quickly, checking down to Otten, which is why he had like the highest usage of any other week. Detroit's very similar in that regard. Unfortunately, secrets, the blueprints kind of out there. So that's why Otten might be a chalky play, but you can, he'll be, he'll be cheap. So you can offset it with lesser owned uh, expensive players. Maybe. Yeah. Very good idea. Very good idea. Okay, well, let's go into KC at Buffalo rematch of last year's matchup or two years two years ago matchup, I think, where we had that insane shootout with the uh, KC coming out at the very end due to, I think, a penalty. Or, no, not penalty, due to the overtime rules at, at, the, at, mm -hmm. at, at during that year. But it was I knew it was controversial. I just forgot what it was. But anyway, uh, Buffalo is actually a two-and-a-half-point home favorite. I say actually because, you know, we're just so used to KC being like the dominating force and always being like the... Uh, favorite, but yeah, it's Buffalo now, two and a half point home favorite, but very small. So essentially, it could be a tie game. It can, according to this, uh, over under forty six point five. 
Mahomes is actually all time eight one and one when he's an underdog in the playoffs. So very good, very good statistics. He's essentially wins eighty percent of his games when he's an underdog. If you want to look at it that way, and that's and, against the spread. So that's taking the points like he'll he'll cover as an underdog. Oh, I see. Okay, cool. And then, but, uh, yeah, go for it. I was just gonna say this also is Mahomes' first ever road playoff game. Insane. To think he's been in the league for so many years and in the playoffs for so many years, it's his first uh, dog game. That's that's pretty crazy. Uh, but, yeah, I – so a couple of things to consider in this game. Bills lost a, li- a little bit of defensive firepower against the Steelers. Um, it's going to be – I don't know. Like, they both played in very tough conditions. Casey has a little bit of a rest advantage with their two days – I, I'm I'm liking the Chiefs in this one. Who are you liking? I think I'm gonna go with the Chiefs, and I'm gonna regret it. But really, just here, here's my here's the way I look at it. Buffalo, they can't put a team out to save their life, man. They like I don't know how we were sitting there in the fourth quarter and they were only up seven. That that happened against the Steelers after all those touchdowns that Allen scored. They were only up seven. At one point in the fourth quarter, like crazy. Then you have the Chiefs who, if you told me when the season started that they'll have a really dominant defense and I'd be so (laughs) excited about it, this wouldn't even be a question. It's just that their offense has regressed so badly because their biggest playmaker, Kelsey, is just aging right before our eyes. He again in that game against Miami, he had, I think, three drop passes. Like you if if Casey's pulling this out, Kelsey needs to have one of those vintage, like, I'm going to mess you up type of games. Like, I'm talking about, like, nine catches, 100 yards, two t- – like, that. that's the Kelsey they need for this. And something yeah. tells me he's going to show up for this one. Like, it just – it it feels like a Kelsey day, but it also feels like a Pacheco day to me too, especially with the yeah. Bills losing all those defensive players. So, I love a sneaky stack. Bills love turning the ball over. Allen's reckless with the ball. I love Pacheco plus KC defense this week. Ooh, that's a good pick. Good pick. Yeah, Pacheco, KC defense. That combo right there has worked out so many times this year already, so I highly recommend it. I I see what you're saying about Travis Kelsey. I hope he does. I hope he does play really good. Some people are saying that like this might be his you know retirement year. If 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 let's say KC goes and wins this whole thing, Travis can retire and basically just go into the sunset and be like i'm done you know this has nothing else to prove at that point so um yeah Two i like Super that Bowls, right yeah. like he's been to three his brother retired as well and yeah he he strikes me as the type of guy that if he's not the top at his profession he wouldn't mind walking away like i we can see him fading before our eyes but like if yeah. he just pops in the playoffs like let's remember him. Like I, I'm rooting for him, man. I want him to go out strong. Yeah, same, same. I, I agree with you there. I, I don't think anybody wants to see a guy kind of struggle his last last few years. And you know, I rather go see him go out like this versus like another one. Like imagine he comes back next year or two more years. It's kind of like Antonio Gates. Remember Antonio Gates? How good he used to be, but nobody like in the younger generation remembers that because they they only saw the last like what, the last three years when he was nothing? He was basically just a guy in the end zone whenever they would be on the five-yard line. That's all that he became. And it was kind of sad, even though I'm sure he didn't mind getting paid millions of dollars for doing that. So, hey, yeah. when he was a rookie outperforming his deal or whatever, I'm sure the Chargers didn't mind that they didn't have to pay him top dollar, too. So, yeah. I mean, it goes both ways. I mean, it doesn't have to, though. The team could cut him. So, like... I don't know, man. It just the something about this Bills team just doesn't feel right. And it, it's so it's so weird that like are we gonna get so what we're predicting now is a Baltimore KC showdown. And that that's gonna be I, I really have to digest that more, but that that's gonna be everything, man. Like I think that the Bills have a better shot to beating Baltimore than the Chiefs do, even though I think Bills lose this weekend. They just pack the bigger punch that's going to be needed to knock out Baltimore. Why, why do you think Bills have a better chance than KC? Just because the, the reason I ask is 
I feel like Casey has the the defense to kind of stop um, Baltimore, whereas Bills is a bit more inconsistent. I think that either way, Buffalo can keep up with them, right? Like if Baltimore just piles points on Allen, like that's fine. He'll keep up. Like if Baltimore oh, gets on top of Casey, I don't know that Casey can throw their way out of it. I think like they need a more, and it sounds weird that we're talking about a Mahomes team this way, but they need a more controlled environment. Like I think that Casey can do that, script up the game plan in such a way to do that against Buffalo, where it's like, play good D, get the ball, run it out. Buffalo doesn't have a good defense, right? So, like, you yeah. can take advantage of them. But I don't know that you can do the same thing in Baltimore. Like, you're going to need – like, that's really the game, like, where you need all those receivers A to Z at their best. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Okay, so let's break, let's break down the players a little bit. So, on the, on the Buffalo side, of course, Josh Allen is a – someone everybody everybody can consider but do you like uh gabriel davis or do you just stick with stefan diggs in this one and um james cook casey just doesn't let receivers running yeah. backs whatever you name it they they don't let them go crazy and you saw it with tyreek hill last week like yeah i'm not excited about starting any buffalo player but keep, not a also, single one of them. Yeah, even Diggs, because actually Diggs has been playing terrible. He the last I think what four games he's had just like averaging forty or fifty yards, if I'm not mistaken. So I even I take back the Diggs. Um, Maybe name. Kincaid can throw yeah. in a Knox in there. Khalil Shakir, if you want one of those guys, maybe like I could see them doing good. But James Cook, like he was really like go. He was on the downtrend. Entering the playoffs, he did okay against Pittsburgh, but I don't think McDermott's going to hesitate to pull him out of the game if he fumbles, right? Yeah. And that's going to take a big... If you look back at the Casey-Buffalo game um, earlier this year, first of all, Casey didn't have their running back, Pacheco. Second of all, James Cook went crazy in that game. I think he had over 130 scrimmage yards, a touchdown. Like, they're going to need... If I'm just sitting there, like, how am I going to beat Casey? It's Josh Allen not playing hero ball because KC has the secondary to really make you pay on sloppy throws that he likes to just chuck down the field. Like they yeah. they will pick you off. It's more like they need a they need to play more of a conservative game where they're literally like running with Cook and hopefully Cook plays well. Like I don't think like them just taking shots down the field like how Allen Allen loves the home run play. But I feel like Mahomes has learned is more mature to mm. take those checks. He used to have that problem too when people were playing that too high safety like look or shell or whatever. Mahomes used to throw picks left and right, and then he adjusted. He started taking the checkdowns. They're running with Pacheco more. Like Casey's more built for a game like this than Buffalo is. Yeah, that was like three years ago when we saw like, kind of Mahomes go through that regression or basically go through that interception phase and. Yeah, like you said, he kind of learned more about being a smarter quarterback, learning how to drop uh, drop down and so forth. So yeah, but totally totally agree with you there. Um on the on the KC side, we do have Mahomes, uh Pacheco, uh Pacheco and the Chiefs is our favorite stack for for this for this game. And then uh Rice, of course, good option, cheap option. Not cheap, but not cheap anymore, but still cheaper compared to other options. And uh, so w would you do like a okay? Let's say let's say okay. There's a Pacheco Chiefs uh, Chiefs defense stack, and then on the other hand, what if you did like a, a as another option, Mahomes, Rice, and a Kelsey stack? Or is that too crazy? I don't think that's insane. I wouldn't. I mean, you you can't have all five of them on a four game slate you need to spread out a little oh, more yeah, yeah. but i, I just yeah, mean like if you had to on choose a, on a either separate. or yeah yeah i mean i i think a rice kelsey one is a really good one as well but just keep in mind that jerick mckinnon right like normally the pass catching back for casey's he's he's on ir so like it's all pacheco whatever oh, yeah. it is pass cat and you what didn't CH comes into, but I mean, like that, it's not to the degree that McKinnon was taking uh volume away from Pacheco. But 
the the key thing here is in Miami, you didn't really see Pacheco flash that much as pass catching abilities because like it was more of a colder game, icy or whatever, very similar to what was being played in Buffalo. So I think you might see that like pass, like a lot of check downs to Pacheco. And I really like Kelsey too. If you want to throw Kelsey in there, I think this might be his game. Can you can you do Kelsey without Mahomes? If you do, let's say Pacheco, Kelsey, and um, yeah, uh, I don't Chiefs see defense. why not. Yeah, on on a short slate. Look, you're trying to like at the end of the day when there's four games, right? Like the way that you, it's actually very simple to break down. Just ask yourself which QB is going to score the most, which running back is going to score the most, which wide receiver X Y Z, right? If you yeah. asked yourself those questions last week, you could have gotten pretty close to what actually happened. I mean, it was very chalk hits on short slates so who do you think is who, who's been the most consistent guy out of all these four games christian mccaffrey he's probably going to be the highest scoring guy on this slate like bar none like that that's probably what's going to happen or at least at his position you need to have him in your lineup right like he, he's going to do it but then you have to ask yourself like which qb like you go up and down the list like a lot of these games i don't know which ones are going to be close but there's one that is a really like there's one game that has a very good favorable matchup for a QB and that's the only game in a dome and that's Jared Goff playing Tampa like for me mm. that one sticks out to me as one that I want to really like invest a lot in so that's how you break it down you just have to kind of like go up and down the list and be like who do I think is going to be highest scoring at each position and then try to fit them all in your lineup and fi- and then when you do that, though, you're going to have a lot of salary, like you're going to spend a lot of salary, right? But mm-hmm. then you need to find people like Jamison Williams to fill that spot in. Cade Auten, you know, like yep. those cheaper guys. You need to pick and choose. You can't just start Evans, ASB, um, CMC, Patrick Mahone. Like that's not how DFS works. It's a salary cap thing. So you got to pick and choose. but Generally, if you see a stack you like, if you see a wide receiver QB combo like ASB Goff is one that I really like this week, or maybe you, the listener, likes Purdy Ayuk, go for it. Like that, yeah. that's what DFS is all about. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. You just you just draw, give such good science on how to do lineups, especially right now during the most important time of the year when it's like even harder with like shorter slates. So great job there and you should be doing one-on-one coaching for DFS matchups, man. <laughs> Dude, so, when, this, when the slates are shorter, it's actually, like, for me, very simple. And I mm-hmm. love, like, showdowns because it just eliminates the noise. With longer slates, you need to get creative. Like, you can't you can't do what I just did when there's 13 other games. Like, it, it just it doesn't hit that way. Then you have to look at ROI, value, whatever. Just pick who's going to score the most and then go yeah. from there. Yeah. I agree with you too. I think the smaller slates are easier. You have less selections and kind of like less mistakes you can kind of make, but also you can think more like what is the what is the public gonna do? What is the league gonna do? Most people are probably gonna start this guy. So let me go at this guy. You know, there's a lot of uh thought about thought behind it. And everyone's gonna probably start CMC. Yeah. It's gonna happen. But he's if you don't start him, you're probably not gonna win your league or your contest. But I mean it's a good contrarian move to fade him, but I don't know that I would do that against the Packers D that's so tired in what could be bad weather with 17 mile per hour wins for passing game. So yeah, for sure. For at sure. your own risk. All right. Well, I guess that covers the KC Buffalo game and the lap, which is the last game of the uh, divisional playoffs. Uh, keep in mind, everybody, there are the games will be on Saturday and Sunday. So it won't be all on Sunday, just so you don't miss the Saturday games. But um, what what game are you the most excited to watch, Andrew? Oh, by far, I'm very excited to watch the Buffalo KC rematch. That's gonna be fun. Seeing Mahomes in his first road playoff game. Yeah, that, I I don't know how you could have a di- oh, actually, as a Packers fan, I'm sure you're I mean, most excited about a Green Bay San Francisco. I am, but I'll probably also be the most disappointed at, by the end of it. But still, if I had to pick one, I would probably pick, as a non-Packer fan, I would pick the KC Buffalo game too, just because of the 
the matchup and the rematch that we're going to see. And I'm hoping it's just going to be one of those, like, uh, you know, barn burners. Yeah. Yeah. It, we'll, we'll see what happens. But all I know is we got only seven games left this NFL season, which is just crazy to even say out loud. It, it yeah. definitely, I mean, I think we could all, you know, we're all looking forward to the Super Bowl. But, you know, for teams that suck like mine, like the Falcons, I'm excited <laughs> for the draft, too. And we're going to be here to break down the draft, give you the latest yeah. and greatest with mock drafts and everything, too. So those okay. episodes are obviously going to be much shorter, but we're going to, you know, talk through free agency, what moves we like, we didn't like. So that's upcoming, too, on this podcast. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. We'll we'll break down the rookies and what we're seeing. And especially for dynasties, too, if you're in a dynasty league, you know, you're going to want to hear all, all about the rookies that's coming into the into the scout. The, yeah, there's a the lot combine. of good receivers coming out this year so yeah and qb potential too so stay tuned for that yep yep all right well thanks everybody good luck in your dfs lineups this week and good luck if any of your personal teams are in the playoffs as well until next week this is andrew and Sidak, and we'll see you next time all right fuck yeah